Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On February 3rd, 2008, Eli Manning eluded what seemed to be 34 New England Patriots and yelled YOLO as he heaved the Duke down the field in Super Bowl 42. Let's just say we all know what happened next. A moment where Rodney Harrison wishes he could steal the keys to my DeLorean because we're here witnessing the helmet catch. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to Come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time we still have the DeLorean. The date is February 3rd, 2008, and we are at University Phoenix Stadium in Arizona. We're here to watch Super Bowl 42, the mighty undefeated New England Patriots roll into town to take on the wild card wielding road warriors that are the New York football giants. With only one minute and 15 seconds left on the clock, it sure seemed destined like the Patriots going to make history, become the first undefeated champion since the 72 Dolphins. And there would have been even more games, so they would have broken the record because, well, I mean, naturally, it was a longer season. And this also happened to be in the free agency era, so you could argue, maybe more challenging. But then, at their own 44-yard line on a third and five, Eli Manning connects with David Tyree well, for what would go down as one of the greatest and remembered moments in Super Bowl, well, well heck, NFL, wait, I'll up the ante even, sports history, period. It was the David Tyree helmet catch. And during the NFL 100 celebration, it was even named as the third greatest play in NFL history. But why am I bringing this up this week? Well, this week's guest grew up in Suffolk County on Long Island. He wasn't even 10 years old yet, but it was possibly already the greatest sports moment that his hometown New York football giants would ever be a part of, and that he was able to witness. But then again. This week's guest is only in his early 20s, so he doesn't know anything about the history of the NFL, right? Wrong, because he's not one to say what happened less than two decades ago is for certain the greatest moment in NFL history. He's one to look at all of professional football history. And we're not talking about when the NFL was founded in Ralph Hayes up be a lot of showroom in 1920. This guy is a student of the history of the game. Way back. Not just from what a lot of people want to talk about. NFL really started in the 60s and 70s, you know, with the merger and such. As you're soon to find out, this guy, again, is a student in the entire history of professional football. His name is Vinny Las Penuso. And I challenge you. Yeah, I challenge you. I'll throw that out there. I challenge you to find someone that is as passionate and knowledgeable about sports history at this guy's age. More specifically, even football history for this show. When I first heard Vinny speak on a recent episode that I participated in with, you know, the whole let's get this year's and trinies in the Hall of Fame. This was on Not In Hall of Fame podcast. And seeing all of his comments out there, I too was skeptical about this. I'll go ahead and say it. I'm getting old. It's this kid. But then I got a chance to interview and have a great conversation with Vinny. 
He is an amazing advocate for all of football history, not just what happened five seconds ago on Twitter or something like that. And yes, he did grow up in this fast-paced digital age. In fact, there's going to be another episode that's going to release over on Yesterday's Sports, where he sat down for a we'll call a roundtable discussion with Mark Mortier and Dave DiPolo, and both of them just raved about how impressed they were at his age, how passionate and how knowledgeable he was about sports history. You would think this guy has lived 10 decades on this planet, but he's in his early 20s still, and he can draw up information like nobody's business. And I promise you, I didn't even edit this episode just to make him look good. It's straight up raw cut. It's left on the floor, whatever you want to call it. I mean, sure, you may have to clean up a little bit of the auto just to make sure it sounded better. But basically, this is the entire thing. Ask him a question, pulls it out of his brain. Nobody's business. But don't take my word for it. Let's get into this interview with Vinny Laspinuso. Okay, yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, we'll, we'll do the whole correlation thing. Let's get into that, though, Vinny. Let's get an overview first. So like, so when we do splice this in, I'm going to go, hey, Vinny Laspinuso, what is an overview? However you want to uh, describe yourself to the listener of the Football History Dude podcast and maybe a little bit of your body of work. Well, um, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Vinny Laspinuso. You probably know me on Twitter from anyone that follows Anything in regards to the Halls of Fame, you'll see my face and my profile. You'll see everything on there that shows me always commenting to her situation. But I'll always say the most unique names you can find that for people I want to see in the Halls of Fame. And even mostly because I just love history. And I'm someone who just graduated from sports journalism. I'm trying to get into the field, but so far... Uh, I've done a good body of work. I've been in Not in the Hall of Fame's uh, podcast, Kirk Buckner, great guy. I've also been on Zenny CC2 Media's vlog, Zenny Abraham, another great gentleman as well. I also have done work for American Football International. I've been writing articles for international football leagues. Uh, Roger Kelly, the uh, the leader of the group, the head and the founder of the website, also an amazing gentleman as well. He worked for the CFL for many years. Um and I've also been working for an actual Hall of Fame, the Suffolk County Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, Chris Vaccaro, amazing dude. Um, I run their social media posts and everything. And I do also a lot of research for them. Yeah, that's something that you mentioned earlier. You're always commenting. That's something I can appreciate from you is you're always willing to jump into the conversation regardless of what it is. And we're, we're going to focus more on football history just because the nature of the show. But are you yeah, a wide ranging I- all sports kind of lover? Yes, uh, I am someone that ever since I was little, this just goes for everything. Both of my parents have been school teachers for the last three decades. So I've always come from a background of being very, very wide open in terms of my ideas. I always had a passion for very particular things, but I've always had a love for a little bit of everything. Like it, I can, my, my, um, my aunt once told me that he said, Hey, she said, Hey, Vincent, whatever field you get in, you'd know what to do because I've always had an understanding for at least the bare concepts of it. And like, I've always had to have a passion for history. My dad has been a U.S. history teacher um, over in a NASA at Hewlett Woodmere. And, you know, that's just interest of history and knowing how the world works. It also kind of led me to what Wikipedia is. And I've been using Wikipedia, like legit reading and even editing Wikipedia since I was nine years old. So that's, give me a huge impact on the way I think and also the way I see the world and also cases and everything. You know, that's something that you bring up a good point because a lot of people that will always talk about the next generation that's coming out, they're like, oh, they don't care about certain things. I, I think we're, we've transitioned. Now it's the younger generation is more interested in, say, the history and how things work. And maybe I'm stating that wrong, especially for the most of the listeners of the show. But, you know, <laughs> you have more of an intrigue from that. I'm I'm probably literally I'm, – I'm older than you, I'm guessing, at 37. You're what, in the mid-20s I'm taking it? No, I'm actually going to be 23 at the end of June. Oh wow, yeah. So again, you were, there's a good there's a good gap right there for us as far as age. But I think that you know, talking to people that are more in your generation, it's there is more of I don't want, I don't know how to even pinpoint. I'm trying to come up with the right word, but like 
look at the world through a different lens versus, and you came up with two teachers. I mean, that right there alone, just ask, begged the question to always ask, ask the question and say, why I, I got to imagine growing up. I was always known as someone who talked a lot and someone who asked a lot of questions. My scout masters, um, said this a lot of times, uh, back in boy scouts, you know, God, God Eagle, which was, in case you're curious, that that was another big body of work for me. I always always loved the outdoors too. They always said, Vincent, you're always you're always a talker. You always talk about literally everything, <laughs> even if it's not related. You always would say something, and you know that does get me in trouble sometimes. I, I I'd be lying if I said it somehow didn't, but it always made me question things, like very basic things. I would always question because no one seemed to have a good answer for, it. and. I always ask how certain things work and they just say, that's the way they said, no, how do they work? Why is this like this? And they would never say it. So I would have to do my own stuff. I'd have to go up on Wikipedia, for instance. But another thing too, another big influence for me, and this is not related to sports. It's actually related to food. You know, the show Good Eats. I've, I've seen I've some, I've never actually watched it, but I've heard of it. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. What Alton Brown would always do is that before he would even make the food, he would tell you the history of how that food was even created in the first place. And he would go into depth where in the world that's from, why they did it, why they decided to use the ingredients in particular. And he would create a story. He would create the story of the actual dish itself. And it makes you really intrigued to see how that's made in the end. And that idea of just food as someone who comes from a family where both my parents are Italian. Um, my, my great grand, my great parent, great parents came here from Italy. So that always gave me an interest, you know, food for one thing, but that was also my thought process for everything in particular. Like, okay, there's a thing here. How is it made? Why is it like that? And speaking of how it's made, that's another show. I was also very big into as a child because Brooks, Brooks Moore, I think his name was, would always go into detail. How is it made in the factory? And he goes the every step by step thing and even gives a little history of why that's done. Yeah, I just I had to look up the goodies. Now that you mentioned that, I, I have seen that guy before on a few different things. So I know what you're talking about and the how it's made I've been into. And I think that's one reason why I like the the football history show. I mean, just sports in general now with the Sports History Network. But just, again, going back to how do we get to where we are versus just, oh, well, that's the way it always was. And particularly for you, before we get into the whole asking the question, and I don't want to say bucking the system, but willing to ask well why is that the way it is what did you have a favorite team player growing up or were you just a fan of everything uh as i've gotten older i become more of a fan of everything but growing up as you know a, a kid and you know the middle of Suffolk county uh i grew up watching the giants play tiki barber was always my favorite player um i actually got a signature for one of his children's book that he did with ronde uh back in huntington the, the sign the book signing was the line was long but you know it was it was cool um but as time has gone on, when it comes to all my sports teams, I don't really have a set team anymore. I've become someone that likes to cheer for individuals as opposed to teams itself. Like a lot of fans, Falcons fans think I'm a I'm a Falcons fan or even a Colts fan because I follow Matt Ryan religiously. No, the reason why I follow Matt Ryan religiously is I felt so bad for how the media and other fans were dunking on him and completely bomb blasting him after the team lost. And I just became a huge fan of him. I, I I connect with I connect with certain individuals and certain ideas from a much deeper perspective than I like the color of the jersey or something like that. I look at it from a much, much deeper lens. You think it's it's like the story and the hero's journey versus just the actual what happens on the field type of thing then? Yes. I, I look at it much more from a romantic side i guess you can say that doesn't mean i like i love the superficial aspects as well i'm someone that has always you know has always loved the visual aspect i've always loved like you know logos of things growing up and you know i've always had a huge fascination with that and i love that stuff too but a big reason for why i get interested in a particular player from a much more psychological level is because of that person's story and how you connect with him from a human aspect 
that always felt more interesting to me than just, oh, I like him because oh, he's a great player. No, I connect from a much, much deeper perspective. Okay, so then maybe that's a good way to transition to how I found you. And like you said earlier, uh, there's always this this one dude that wants to comment on every single post about the Hall of Fame and everything. So <laughs> how, how did you – okay, first let's just go with um, how did you fall in love with Halls of Fame in general? That's a very unique story because you might think I've always been a huge sports guy. You would think that when you see me. Actually, I wasn't. Hmm. I, I liked sports, but I was never passionate into sports. I was always more of like a platformer video game kind of a kid. Like that's what I was like. I mean, I my dad was the coach for a lot of the teams, but I was never good. Um, but what I did love was crossover games. Like on the PS2, I would have Marvel Ultimate Alliance. That's a game I would play. Amazing game. But all those great Marvel characters, Spider-Man, Hulk, Wolverine, Captain America. I even had another version. Um a, a, a game that was similar to that, except there was only four characters, Nicktoons Unite. That had, you know, SpongeBob, Jimmy Neutron, Danny Phantom, Timmy Turner. And there would be another game I would also play for the Wii, Super Smash Brothers Brawl. That's a game that had, you know, now the series has like 91 characters, but back then it had 39 characters. And I would notice how for all of these games, they would have something that's very similar in common. It would be a crossover event of what was seen as the best uh, characters and people, especially in the Smash Brothers side, as time has gone on, got more and more aggressive with each other as they fought for what character they want to see playable in the next installment. And I said, wow, this is insane, but also really fascinating because people find that if a character is playable in a particular video game, then their legacy is cemented. And so as I've gotten older and when I went to high school and I kind of merged into sports, I fall in love with sports really at, in, in 10th grade. I realized that halls of fame were very similar to that in terms of at fighting with each other nonstop and demeaning those like completely just demeaning and trashing those and saying, that's why I hate the term very good because it's always used very passive aggressively. It's very similar to how like when, fans of Smash Brothers would demean a character, a fan of like Crash Bandicoot or Waluigi or these other characters they want to see playable in that because they're afraid that character could be in the way of their character in the same way that a lot of people get angry when one person, when one player, whoever gets in because they feel that person got in the way of who they want. So it just was an easy connection. And then someone who loves history I just kind of put two and two together and he said, this makes a lot of sense. You know, I got to say that's other than Madden, that's the first time we've ever talked about video games on this show. And I grew up playing probably at a different era than the games that you were too. But, you know, I started off with the Mario's and I got into some of the ones you're talking about. And just more recently, you know, the Halo show comes out, which is reminiscent of the movie or the, you know, the games and stuff. But I can see what you're saying. Yeah, there's always these different, like, like we've, we had these characters that level up, right? And then the the uh, players themselves level up. And then, like you said, the crossovers where they have the Hall of Fame events. So that's a, a unique way to get into something that then turns into a love for sports. That's uh, Yeah, like in the thing, too, I, I liked Mario, but that that was never like that was never like my first video game love, though. Uh, it was Sonic, actually. OK, uh, that's that's always been like my love uh, with games it's it's always been a huge passion for me and it's always been a big i guess you can say a big emotional part of me too uh for whatever reason and i don't know it's just a weird like situation with that but in terms of sports yeah it's like it's always been kind of just fascinating how like i equated crossover video games and that built into halls of fame just because of how people would react to one another it's it's weird but it also makes sense. I mean, <laughs> no, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, like you said it, it again, and, and I'm, I'm picturing the different games where it would be say a crossover event or it'd be fighting to the top and it would be no different than say bracketology for basketball or it would be just anything. And 
I, I firmly believe that a big reason why the NFL took a big st- another step forward with certain individuals that were casual fans, a game like Madden, they got into that. You know, they would have mm-hmm. never captured that audience. Fantasy football obviously played a huge deal into it and everything. You're, you're pointing your finger like you got a story to tell. Go ahead. I want to mention this, uh, and I think you were going to mention this question. I get heat from some people that are big into Halls of Fame for saying this, and but you probably noticed that I'm not really as big into players. Have you have you noticed that? Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, that's something that I want to talk to you about. Of course, yeah, you you kind of alluded. Let's just jump there forward. Let's talk about why are you so passionate, and if not, you have a particular vigor for wanting to represent contributors in the Hall of Fame. Why is that? It's because growing up, I would also be told about these inventors, you know, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, all these men and women that put their life forward and literally changed society for the better. Those, to me, are the real innovators of society, not the people that led the country. They looked were big, too. Those were huge. But to me... It, like Louis Braille or all these great inventors, those are the people that actually change society for the better. And you know, whatever I mention them to, I've always felt that way because one could say, oh, that would get invented later on. Are you sure about that? Are, are you sure about that? But when would it happen? The fact matters we don't know because what matters is that you could say what if all you want, but at the end of the day, this person invented that. And this person created it. This person innovated that. This person is responsible for this. So they should get their flowers instead of having all these people say, oh, but that would have been done somewhere else. But whenever I mention contributors to some fans, they seem to get angry at me. Really angry for some reason. I talk about contributors a lot. And sometimes they, but sometimes you hear them say they're not important they're little farts. They're not significant. They did one little cool thing. They're not actually big for the game. BS. That is complete nonsense. That is a complete and unadulterated lie. It is just a situation of people feeling like a contributor is in the way of a player they want. That is all it is in my mind. And the reason why I like contributors more than players is because They're the ones people don't often push for and the ones that are also more interesting to me because it's way more fields than just playing the game. It's also owning a team. It's also building a roster, scouting players, inventing things, telling those games, everything else. Those have always been far more interesting to me because it is way deeper than just playing the game. Okay, so let's give you a platform, even though I know you've spoken on this before. Let's go with first, let's go a Mount Rushmore of contributors that you think should be in that are not in right now. And why, of course. Hmm. Well, let's start with a very easy one. Uh, Oliver David Thompson, O.D. Thompson. This was a man who back in 1892, well, 1890, after after leaving Yale, he was one of the creators of football itself. He was the first guy to ever throw a football. All the trivial knowledge. No, it's not trivial knowledge. It's pretty significant. Um, he decided to go to Allegheny, which is modern day northern Pittsburgh, and decided to create um, the Western Profe- uh, Western Pennsylvania Professional Football Circuit, which was the first ever professional football league in um, ever. That was the first ever do it. And in 1892, he made it professional by signing uh, uh, William Heffelfinger, a uh, Pudge Heffelfinger, to a contract, and his team would win four championships. That, to me, I think if you're talking any contributor, he's like ground zero. Because without him, there would be no professional football. Like, as simple as that. Um, another person I've always thought really deserved it is Ralph Hay. A lot, of people just, a lot of people just think, you know, oh, football started in Canton, Ohio. No, it didn't. I, I, I said professional football started in Allegheny, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with O.D. Thompson. They never mentioned that. But Ralph Hay did start the NFL. He was the one that brought all the owners together, and his Canton Bulldogs were one of the best teams of the early NFL and the Ohio League as well, which was another professional league that happened before uh, the NFL. That's another huge, 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 significant person 
uh, in my opinion. And for two other contributors I mentioned, uh, these two are more oddball wildcard ones. Because, well, the first two are about the creation of the game itself. These two created something in which it helped the game's popularity. Uh, Wilfred Winkenbach, he was a minority owner of the Raiders in the 1960s, and he decided to create fantasy football. The fantasy football is now worth actually more than the NFL. Um, some say, oh, that's not actual football. Give me a break. It's it's a significant part of professional football. It is so involved within the game of professional football. We talk about it all the time. The NFL mentions fantasy football all the time when it comes to the game itself and its impact around the world and how it gets big. Fantasy football is the next step right after playing the game. And in many cases, you could argue it's bigger than the game itself because way more money is involved. And Wilfred Winkenbach was the person that helped make that happen. And the final person I would put on those Mount Rushmore of NFL contributors is Trip Hawkins. Trip Hawkins um, was the founder of Electronic Arts. And he decided to found the company because he loved the Stratomatic football games growing up as a child. And so as a result, he created the Madden games, who he got Madden because he was available in the Bay Area at the time. They he was trying to get Joe Montana. Joe Cap was another option, but John Madden was the one they end up with in the end. And, you know, the rest is history. Right after fantasy football, the NFL and the game itself always mentions the Madden games as a huge, significant part. And one could say, oh, this is a football video game. Nonsense. It changed the way people view the game as well as the way coaching is done. People have become coaches and have been motivated by the game because of it. And those to me are my Mount Rushmore. You have the guy that made the sport a thing, the guy that made the NFL a thing, the guy that made casual audiences have their eyeballs on, and the guy that made brand new people understand the game in a much more complex level. Yeah, I okay. So I didn't, uh, you know, listener behind the scenes. I truly will tell you, I did not know he was going to say those contributors. And I got, of course, the two first ones. A lot of people I could see arguing from, you know, even NFL historians would argue for those two. But the second to you about Wickenbach and the guy, I don't know the the Trip gentleman. Hawkins. Okay, Trip for Hawkins. for EA, um, I will full heartedly be, uh, contribute the uh, a, a, a resounding resentment that yes, those two individuals are one reason why the NFL now will has continued to survive the way it has with bringing in new blood, bringing in, you know, the different mentalities and things like that. Because yes, even though fantasy football and video games are not actually playing the game, you know, a lot of historians that are listening to this right now might not like this statement, but if it wasn't for those two things, all of the other, you know, violence and stuff like that, that's going on that people, you know, concussions and, if it wasn't for those two contributors, the, the, there's no way the NFL would be where it is today because a lot of people, I can tell you even just say my fantasy football leagues that I've played in, for instance, half of them would never even pick up watching a NFL or even think about getting NFL ticket or anything like that unless because, well, they want to watch their, their team. So 100% would agree with those two. I don't know how um, getting them in because there are so many great people that we want to be able. So I'm going to give you... I'm knighting you right now that you're your knights of the round table of the <laughs> hall of fame. You're 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 inside and you can help with altering how they put people in the hall of fame, contribute change one rule or process or even more. If you want, how are we going to get contributors in the hall of fame? But at the same time, there's so many, there's so many people out there that have had injustices that are not in the hall of fame, right? Like how do we get to that point? Well, first I would make the entire uh, field um, completely transparent. I would have every single vote public. That is one thing I would absolutely do. And I would have everyone's statement also be public. And I would make sure that the entire Hall of Fame uh, discussion, I would have that live on, on YouTube. I would, I would have that entirely live on YouTube so that way everyone could see it for free. Because to me, people say oh, it's a sacred. No, it's not sacred. It's a business. Like plain and simple. I'm going to say it is a business. It's always been a business. And people could say, 
Oh, you can't have this because of this reason. Come on, man. Don't, 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 don't spread your agenda onto me. I'm not going to fall for that. Um, I'm not trying to like be rude to them. I'm just saying in general uh, that you know I'm not going to. I know it's people can be romantic, but at the same time, at its core, it is a business, and I know that it's good to do this to gain public trust. And I think having you know the video having video go on for the entire um, debating, as well as the actual presentations and the votes be public, I think that's a great way to build trust. Second of all, besides making the whole thing transparent, what I would do is that I would um, make the field a little bit larger for modern senior and contributors. And I would even consider adding in another category um, for people to get bronze busts. That would be like pioneers, like racial pioneers, like a Kenny Washington or a Charles Fallis, some of those people. I think what I love about uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame is that they've inducted people based on that. And because you know, we talk all about you know the legends, the trailblazers and everything, I feel like having football for that would also just bring in way more fans to um, into the field and, and into the uh, into following the hall itself. And you know, I would I would expand the number of contributors. I think one is way too little. I think you need to have at least two contributors a year because people always say, "Oh, there's way more players than contributors." Maybe, but I don't think it's as large as people say. I think the number of contributors that are actually in the league again, that's everyone that's not a player or a coach. That's a massive, massive, massive field. So I think it's a complete injustice, in my opinion, to just say, oh, they're not actually important. Okay, says who? You don't know that. <laughs> like, I can go and list 50 to 100 names off the top of my head of people that would be contributors. And you could even be a little bit loose with that term for not just pe- people that had you know quality, um, like a Chris Collinsworth would fit this mold. He's someone that, was a really good player. He was also a broadcaster and he was also someone that helped make PFF what it is. That is someone I would, I would have for wiggle room as a contributor because I view contributor from a much broader perspective than what other people do. And finally, what I would do is this would, this would get some flack from others. I would consider for the moderns, I would consider fans to have a little bit of a say. I would have like, maybe it's like one, one vote in the room, two votes, or maybe it's 5% of the vote. I would consider having fans have a little bit of a say because, you know, people always say that they know more than the people in charge. Okay, let's see it. Cause I know that there's a lot of fans that are like that. And one could say, Oh, it makes it unfair, but people already say that the process is unfair as it is. So I'm just saying people say that with everything. So it doesn't really shock me that there is some pushback and I kind of want to see more than just, you know, the voters because this isn't, I want to see more. I want to see fresh blood. So that's what I, those would be three things I would do. I would make it transparent entirely. I would add more people that would be inducted per year based on certain fields and I would also have different people vote um, in general because I think that would make it much more fair and that would include fans. I think if done right, all three of those could be, you know, the, the the live thing, first of all. Yeah, I could actually having transparency, people being able to see what's going on. Maybe there's something that, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I, I can't think off the top of my head why it would matter, what that it would be, you know, why it can't be transparent. But yeah, sure. Okay. Maybe there's a few things that they do before or after the meeting, but having that transparency. And of course, you just mentioned a business. Tell me that that wouldn't be down the road. Yeah, sure. How people are going to watch it? They watch the NFL draft. I mean, they're going to watch that too. So you can market, oh, yeah. you know, business too. Um, the fact of having, we'll, we'll skip to the end. Having fans somehow voting in, I, I think, would be wise. I don't know. You know, as long as they have it to the point where they're they're making it so it's not totally just a popularity contest. Let's go with the middle, though. I want to ask you the question. So, I'm not against having more people, but at the same time, how would we implement? How, how would we implement that having more in because there are so many that are probably worthy, but at the same time, not taking away from the meaning of what it is to have the bronze best and the gold jacket? Like, how, how do we transition to that, you think? I think we also, I mean, people say the meaning all the time. In reality, they just want their guys in. 
if I, I'm mean frank with you, everyone says the meaning it's so hard. Let's be real here. They just want their guys in the Hall of Fame. That goes with literally everyone. It goes with the voters. It goes with the fans. It goes with the teams. It goes with literally everyone under the sun. People could say about the meaning of everything. To me, I think that's nonsense. I believe it's they all just want their guy in. And I, I'm i like that too. I want a lot of guys in. I know <laughs> that's not very popular to say with others, but I'll be frank. I want a lot of guys in. I, there's, I, I have a whole list of people I want in. I have no shame in saying I want a lot of people in. And some people get at me and saying like, you know, oh, that means you're not really concise with what you really want. But with me, I actually do the opposite. I see myself as more open to the ideas. Like some say, oh, you're uninformed for saying this thing or you're not. With me, by having a pool that's somewhat larger, it actually makes it a little bit easier and I don't get super attached to just a few. So that way I can just pick from a few and build a case for it. There, now, there are some I want really much, but at the same time, I just keep that open. I just keep it open a little bit in order to have that. So what I would do is like, I would be aware that there are many positions that are not recognized enough. And I would make it so that way that people want to see their guys. I would make it a little bit easier for them. But at the same time, I would emphasize that it's still extremely important. I would say that you're getting the people that you've always wanted. Some people that you may not have wanted before, but in hindsight, it makes it much more filling and much more lush because those people are there. And I would show the importance of it by, you know, the ticket sales, you know, the number of people that are in and also just the impact it has on people. And I think you would still have that with the philosophy that I'm having in my head with it. Yeah, I mean, it did go over well with the centennial class. And maybe that's something that, you know, however it's transpired, but you have it, you have the ability to bring in more that were maybe at the cusp of it. Granted, not enough contributors in some people's mind as well, or even coaches. I mean, there were, there were a couple, was it two or three coaches in the season? There were, there were, you know, five moderns, 10 seniors, three contributors, and two coaches. And, you know, some, a lot of voters that were usually there were annoyed by it because they didn't get the vote. But to me, I say, they were only just saying that because they were just salty. They weren't in that room that they had other people do it. Like you had chances over the years to induct people like Don Coriel and many others and you didn't do it. So don't go ahead and blame these people for stuff that you didn't do. Like I, that's why I think their comments are just comes off as very salty, like, and kind of, you can't really read the room and I'm not trying to say this a dunk on them. They're, they're brilliant men and women, but I'm just saying like the comments, especially out of context come off as very, very salty. They really do. And it, it makes me, it almost seems very hypocritical to make that kind of a judgment. Yeah. I, mean, I, are, I don't really get a whole lot into, like you said, I, the following with comments and things like that are going on. So I can't really comment on that either. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry, I do. <laughs> yeah, I know you do enough for everybody in the room, but I mean that's that can be of course perceived as one way, like you said, of you know, maybe non informed, but at the same time, you know, you're willing to spark conversation. And that's where I'm at. I'm always willing to ask that question and you know, not look at it from a lens of like this is the only way to do it. And even asking that question of, you know, does it take away from the greatness of what the player or the contributor or the coach would have been? It's Let's look at it. Maybe things are changing just like the whole world is changing. And maybe 40, was it 43 years of NFL seasons? And don't forget about the pro football before that, even before you yeah. even had one class inducted. So there's a lot of seasons in between the first class. So I could see that, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe we should think about bringing more into it. Yeah. Like with me, I'm a huge pre NFL guy. And, you know, a lot of people are very, like, you probably see some of my conversation with some people, like, a lot of people I run into are very, this must be this way, that way must. And I don't like that mentality at all because it comes off as very, very elitist. Um, and yeah, I understand the idea that all supposed to be special, but I never liked that mentality because it comes off like, I know more than you. I know more than you. I do it better than you. I, I'm, I, I understand it better than you. I'm smarter. Than I don't like that mentality because it gives off those vibes. And I usually get, I kind of, I sometimes get very reactionary over it because it comes off like I know better than you. It comes off very 
it comes off very cocky. It comes off very, you know, aggressive. It comes off, you know, not really fun. It really doesn't. And this is supposed to be fun, but those people that often come in there with that, I don't care for that. And it's a just, it almost kind of feels like what my idea is really that much of a threat to the Hall of Fame, really. Like, I don't think that's their intention, but like, it just comes off like that because I do care about this stuff. And I think it's good not to be so strict in one way because in reality, you could say about how, oh, the bar of this, the bar. In reality, I think everyone's case is unique in, in many different ways. So that's why I don't have a whole strict bar one way or another. That, that's how I feel. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. If you and and again, you got to be open and willing to just look at it, at so many different options and not be uh, by way or the highway or like you said, you know, yeah. I know better than you. And and uh, so, okay, let's transition now. You don't have to say Mount Rushmore, whatever you want to do, but uh, let's give some love, whatever you want to call it, to some of the top historians or whatever it is contributors that are that you follow that you think that should be recognized on this show. Uh, for just historians as a whole? Just in general, like maybe a few names or, or blogs, whatever it is. Like if you had to give somebody some love that would, you know, maybe even if they've never been recognized before publicly, let's give them some love right now. Well, I got to give love to um, the Pro Football Reachers Association. They've had a list of Hall of Very Good. And that's the only time I ever use the term very good that is not in a mocking way because they actually list the number of players, coaches, and soon they're going to have contributors that people could vote on for people they view as not in the hall of fame. And I'm happy about that because I use that while some use it as that's where they'll stay. I see it and said, let's use that as a springboard to make them in the hall of fame. That's how I view it. Some people don't see it like that, but I view it personally. Okay. Let's use that as a springboard as a case for them to push in. I mean, that's a big reason why I got into Laverne Dillwig or an Al Wistard or an Ox Emerson or a number of other people. Um, Ken Crippen, he's leading the pro football, uh, uh, I think football learning academy. Football think, learning academy. Yeah, he he is he is sharp. That that dude is brilliant, and he knows all about um he knows all about NFL history. He knows about you know football history as a whole. He's such a chock full of knowledge, and he's like one of the first people I would really think of when it comes to like a historian of the game. Um, just just big props to him. I I can't give him enough props because you know he is just I think he's just a very intelligent man. Um. I'd also give credit to um, I also give credit to um, say uh, Kevin Gallagher. That's another guy. He's another person that's always likes to bring up like you know old you know posts of old NFL stuff. Now, grant to be fair, one thing I've always had with a lot of like historians is that you know a big criticism I have is that they always seem to just think the NFL started in like 1960 or just football itself. And yeah, that is a bit of a criticism, but I do love Kevin's content. And I do believe, you know, while, while, while him and I don't exactly see eye to eye in terms of our philosophy, how the Hall of Fame should be, I still believe that he does deserve to have, you know, some credit um, because he does know his stuff. Um, and, you know, like I said before, you know, not the Hall of Fame.com, Kirk Buckner, you know, he's one of the people that helped put me here um, for the podcast. And I want to even say a Hall of Fame voter. Uh, Clark Judge, um, he is the person that when I was a freshman in college, he let me write a piece for him uh, for not in the Hall of Fame for how I thought at the time they should be doing seniors. Even though my mind of how they would do it has changed, I still give him a lot of credit and thank him for doing that. And he'd be willing to help me out with the, the job later on. And if he's able to do that, that's amazing. So those are five pe- five people or five organizations I would give credit to for helping me out. Uh, and there's others, but those yeah, just fine. Yeah, I, I know. I threw you on the spot, too. I'm sure, like, as you'll keep coming up with more. And you mentioned with Kevin Gallagher. So, like you said, you, you people with differing views. I think it's good that we all have differing views. And, of yeah. course, that's what debates and sports are all about. As long as it's, like, respectable, it's, again, it's the let's so, look at it. Sometimes him and I kind of <laughs> put a little too much. But like, I've done that with a lot. Of people, but, you know, I kind of told him to, like, you know, ease up a little bit. And he's begun to understand me a bit more. Um, he he's kind of realized that he's that I, I do like a lot of things and like he he's begun to accept that and I, and I know I'm not going to change everyone's mind. I, I know that people are very sick in their ways. 
I even know that as someone who has followed several historians that do, that are very particular in terms of like, I met one guy, I'm not going to say his name, that said he didn't want O.D. Thompson because, and I quote, he's a privileged white dude. Like, I'm not crazy about that. But, you know, that's his opinion. That's what he says. I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong. I think that's not very wise, but whatever. Like, it's just what orthodox back. It's, I'll let him have his opinion and I'll have mine. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's again, it's a uh, one thing I would even say, as you mentioned in there, like, you know, not, not everyone will ever, you know, uh, there won't be everybody will see my way or whatever. And I think it's, it's good for us to always, uh, what's the best way to to have that conversation to try to make it where we look at other people's viewpoints, but at the same time not disparage what some of the uh, the old historians will will be trying to dispel wisdom upon us. And it, it's okay if you know they're not going to want to be able to move into this you know new wave of thinking or whatever you may want to say it. And yeah, I, again, it is a new wave of thinking. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 that's okay as as long as it's like we're all respectable about it. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I'll say my opinion out here. I think we all have good viewpoints. We all have different uh, walks of life. We all have different you know backgrounds and things like that. And as long as we're all able to like look at it and be respectable of looking at everybody's viewpoints it doesn't mean we have to agree with them it just means that we have to uh, acknowledge them i'll use that as a verb yeah yeah i think we should acknowledge them though i don't like those that is trash on my ideas all the time because <laughs> then, then i get angry then i get kind of angry but, yeah um because like sometimes if i see a contributor i want put it down i've always been the first one that runs in and, and helps them out because like listen i know contributors are not very popular but that's also why i like them I like them because they are the underdog. I like them because they're the ones under the radar. Like I love talking about players, but like talking about sixties and seventies and eighties players all the time just feels boring to me. Like do really need to just talk about this is the goal. Come on. Nah, I'm not one of those people that are just focused on one decade. I focus on everything from the time that football started becoming professional to the very present. That's, that's my era. The entire thing. No bias whatsoever. AFL, AFC, Christ, I'll even throw CFL in there. I am not biased to any particular team or any particular era or any particular position. That is a idea I've had so that way it gives me a much better understanding and I have much more appreciation for everyone involved. Well, because you're not biased and you you are willing to look at every era, then I don't know if you saw me reach behind me. I grabbed my DeLorean for you. This is the actual physical. Ah. Yeah. So on this show, you get to hop in the DeLorean. I, actually, this is the first time you hopped in the DeLorean this time. Normally, it's like a couple of times. You get to go back and point to any moment in pro football history, and you get to live that moment and be a part of it. Where are you going right now? Oh, easy. I'd go back to 1892 when O.D. Thompson decided to, uh, decide to sign uh, Pot Chaffelfinger to a contract. Like that's to me, that's the real play. That's the real birth of pro football, not Canton, not Latrobe, Allegheny, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Odie Thompson. He's the real father of professional football. That's the real guy that got it started. And while there's some that say, oh, it's not that impressive. Considering what the sport has become, I would say in hindsight, it's pretty impressive to me. And I think, you know, while people can talk about a certain era in game to me, it's always about the beginning. The beginning of everything is always the most important part because it it plants the seeds of what can come in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's an origin moment and, you know, you have that time. So, OK, now we'll play a different kind of game. You you hop Odie in, in your in your passenger seat and you bring him to nowadays. You know, what's this? Uh, 130 years later. What do you think he looks at? He watches the game. What do you think? Like what's going through his mind, you think? Well, the game would be completely different. That's one thing. Um, he would also be impressed because professional football was very new, was very, you know, somewhat amateur in a sense because it wasn't very popular. He would be amazing. He would be astonished with how big the game has gotten across the entire world. Millions and millions, if not maybe even billions of people tuning in and viewing these games, whether it be on TV or on their phone, or on their tablets, people going to the games and concession stands, seeing 
stadiums packed every single week to watch a team play, he'd be amazed. He'd be amazed with all this technology that's involved. He's amazed with the merchandise. He's amazed that what he did when he signed that contract 130 years later, it planted the seeds for everything. I think, I think that alone, the guy that made it possible, he would be humbled in ways that you can never imagine. It would be different, but he's the one that made it happen for that all that to happen in the first place. So I think there's no better person than him for professional football than, than him easily. Because he planted the seeds, and I think he would be at a loss for it because he'd be so amazed. He would cry. He really would. And I think that that tear that falls from his cheek would be a good – uh, what word do I want to use here? It, it's something that we as fans now who want to squabble about the little things and, and, you know, like the, and argue and complain about things. It's like to see what this guy coming, you know, back then origin with Pudge Heffelfinger and coming now to the here to see it. It's like, we should think about that in the future is a hundred mm-hmm. years from now, what we do and what we complain about, the things we want, you know, we want to be reactionary so much in today's society. Let's sit back. And I'm not trying to get into like from political perspective. I'm just talking general for football right now. Let's mm-hmm. just look at it and think about it from a long term point of view, because we do want this to survive. As far as I'm concerned, I want this to survive. Yes. And Same I think here. we should do that. We should be. A hundred years from now, I want to have a tear moment for the right reasons. So let's get into uh, the the wrapping up of the show. Do you have any last words of wisdom regarding Halls of Fame for the listener of the show? Yeah, I would say, you know, regardless of who you want, like keep in mind that other people have different views. And no matter who gets in, people are going to be angry. People are going to be reactionary. People are going to send death threats to others. I am someone who firmly believes that yeah, social media is a big part of it, but I genuinely believe that people are much more angry with each other than ever before. Except, I mean, I think everyone was always angry, but I think with social media as a whole, it's definitely made that more open. I've seen more people than ever even say they want to cause mass chaos in reality because of that. So I want everyone to understand that with all the craziness going on, it's always important to remember those small little details as well as the importance of those small little details. You see the football that is being held in the center's hand as the quarterback is about to say hi. Think about that football. Think about where it came from. Think about who invented that. Think about the man who decided to make the creation of the football in that shape. Something as simple as what Thomas Wilson did when he made the Duke many decades and decades ago on request of Willington Mara. That is one example to show how something as small as that actually has a massive impact on the entire game. I feel that for contributors. I feel that for many players. I feel that for a whole bunch of people I want. And I think it's important that, you know, people always talk about how the importance of special teams, well, all that stuff, every single little aspect matters. When you're making a cake, when you're making any kind of food, if you have one ingredient out, it could miss out everything. Remember, it is a team game, and it's important that it's not just a team game on the field, it's also a team game within the organization. It's a team game within the league. It's a team game with people who work on it. If it's the ultimate team game, it's good. It's important. It should be important that every person that represents that part of the team gets acknowledged with the bronze bust in one way, shape, or form. Not everyone, but the people who helped made that happen do at least deserve something. And yeah, I understand not everyone's going to get a trophy, but why does it have to be the case? Why can't the person that helped create what it is get at least a little bit of recognition, if not the full recognition as others. And I think because their little contribution made it much more bigger, I think they deserve the highest honor possible. And Boom. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, that's all I need to say. I mean, yeah, you just ended it perfect right there. I mean, I just that was a great 
great outro. I mean, that was that was awesome as far as like less. You could tell that you think a lot about this. Oh, I think about it daily, man. I, <laughs> I, I, my mind never stops thinking with this stuff. I, I can go into details about how, like, you know, why I would want a certain person. It, it, this is how I am. I've just always been like that. Just always thought like that. There you go. A passionate young individual who wants to make sure that you do not forget about those that are often forgotten. The contributors. Now, I normally end up with like, kind of like a mic drop type moment there at the end. But then right before I was going to hold, you know, cut it off, uh, I figured let's just go ahead and listen to what he had to say about why he's so passionate about this type of a topic. So I just decided let's keep it in the episode. Speaking of the episode and the interview, I hope you enjoyed this interview and you were able to get some great iron knowledge nuggets from this week's guest, Vinny Lespinuso. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe you'll see a new podcast on the Sports History Network with Vinny as the host in the future. Speaking of new shows, If you're interested in starting your own podcast or maybe even dipping your toes in the water and coming on one of our shows, all you got to do is hit us up over on the contact page over on the website. That's sportshistorynetwork.com. Again, just head over to sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.